On this episode of Philomena.com, I'm bringing you something new and special. We're at the headquarters for Teacher Liberia today, and I'm going to be bringing you our first roundtable. In this roundtable, we'll be discussing issues that are relative to Liberians, African Americans, and the injustices we face all over the world. So stay tuned, it's going to be a good, interesting episode. All right, I want to welcome everyone to the first roundtable for Philomena.com. Thank you again for hosting us, Teacher Liberia. We're here at Teacher Liberia in Central Monrovia. And we're going to talk about a lot today. But before we do that, I want to introduce you to my wonderful panel. And these, all these people are my friends. That's what I love about Liberia. Everybody knows everyone. Um, you guys have been asking me, in fact, somebody mentioned on my last interview that I talk too much. So I'm going to give other people a chance to talk. <laughs> so I'm giving you what you guys have been asking for, other opinions, uh, other points of view. So we're going to kick it off. Nikita, go ahead and introduce yourself. Go ahead and start this thing off. Yes. Um, so my name is Nikita. I am the founder, editor, and performing artist at Creative Africa Art Agency in West Africa. All right, Jefferson? Yeah, and I'm Jefferson, and I run a news outlet called Bush Chicken. Um, I'm Marcel. I'm an educator, a teacher, and an artist here in the country. I'm Abraham. I work for Small Liberia as Director of uh, Quality Control. So the first question we're going to pose is, uh, what does Black Lives Matter, the movement, mean in Liberia versus America? Is there a difference? Do you feel like they're the same? Does it mean different things to different people across the pond? And this, this, this kind of uh, goes around the argument of Africans versus African Americans. And that's something that we've been talking about as a group, yeah. that we need to bridge that gap. And at this time, especially in the world, black people need to unify, no matter what, yeah. you know, For sure. where you are, you're in a gang. We've seen gangs tying their rags together. Mm -hmm. So, so Nikita, you, you wanna you want to answer that? Yeah, um, black lives matter. I mean, the fact that we even need that statement is really sad. Uh, in 2020, um, but I think it rings differently in Africa, um, Liberia specifically. I think over the last few weeks, we definitely have gotten a tone from many of um, our African brothers and sisters that this isn't necessarily a movement that's about them. You know, like this is for people that are in the West. This is for um, someone across the ocean. You know because we are in Africa and predominantly there are black people, African people in Africa, um, it really is a different experience. I think you kind of touched on this on your last video. Mm -hmm. You know, the feeling is different when you come to Africa and you're just a part of the majority, right. as opposed to being in a Western country where you are told constantly or feel that you are a minority, you know? Um, so I think it doesn't feel as relevant to a lot of African people um, in Africa and definitely in Liberia. I think all of us have been in conversations where people are like, oh, what is that thing? Yeah. Black lives matter. What is that? Like, you know, like, like, I'm not doing that. Like, what is that? that? You know, that people are doing that yeah, different thing yeah, from yeah, us. Exactly. Um, and I hope that this discussion, you know, I think many of the other questions will start bringing up the fact that you know, Liberia being the first Pan-African state in the world, I think we have a responsibility to really take in the plight of African people, melanated people around the world, and recognize that if our brothers and sisters are being killed in North America, that it does affect us here on the continent as yeah. well. Yeah. I think there is, uh, from my perspective of working with students uh, in Liberia, uh, we support some of the top performing students get access to the international study opportunities. And we have up to 24 students studying in the US. And it's a very important conversation to have towards the end of their time with us talk about racism and talk about how people will see you for something just beyond what you can bring to the table. They will judge you first based on your color and all of those things. Mm -hmm. um, and as a country and, and, and as a world, now that we're all really connected, our fortunes are really intertwined. Um, it's really important to have these conversations here so people understand that just because I'm not directly affected right now because my skin is not the one that's you know, getting burned doesn't mean I shouldn't care about it. Mm -hmm. um, we all know the story of how most people see stuff that's in Liberia and you want to go to the U.S. You want your kids to go get an education in right. the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you want a world wherein they can go and succeed based on their merits, you should stand up and, and say something. Right. And, and you know, represent your voice in the way that you want to hear it. Right. I have nothing. Great point. 
Because the dream is, right? Everybody, you know, everybody, everybody wants, wants to go to America. Especially yeah. Liberians who haven't been to America. Yes. That is like the pinnacle of life. Like we must make it to America. Yeah. And it's really interesting for us who have been there um, to now see the America that we once knew not the same. Mm -hmm. The America that we grew up in has turned quite a bit um, from when mm -hmm. we were young and, and living there. What I wonder if it's turned or if it's just been now more prominent and like highlighted. Yeah, maybe it's been masked for yeah. all these years. I think a lot of the race relation issues right. have come to a boiling point. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it started with Obama, mm -hmm. and I think they were like, okay, I'm gonna let that slide for the first term. Then the second <laughs> term, it was like, oh no, yeah. he's Two still terms. here. Two like, terms. <laughs> and um, and then we now we have uh, Donald Trump in office, and I think oh having that person, that figure as the head of state has given all the maybe undercover racists mm -hmm. uh, confidence to just say, hey, if Trump can do it, mm -hmm. I can do it's, it. It's teetering the line between like, it's always been allowed, but now we're seeing it and now you're questioning if it should continue to be allowed. Mm -hmm. And that's really to me what the Black Lives Matter statement and movement is about. Mm -hmm. Like, are we allowing this? We're just allowing people to get like killed this way and treated this way and mistreated this way for, you know, centuries, even with what we're saying is equal rights or freedom of vote and things like that, it's still not. Right. And one sign I've been seeing at the protest is Black Lives Matter is the minimum. Like, that right. should be it. You know, they not only right. should matter, they should be equal, they should, you know, all these things. Right. Equality, I mean, I think that's the biggest thing that people want is just equality. Like you said, you want to be judged on the merit of your character, not just on the color of your skin. Right. Right. Absolutely. So we're going to move on to the next question. It's pretty interesting. Um, a couple weeks ago, a group in Liberia held a protest at the American Embassy. And I remember when I saw it on my social media, I was like, yes, I love it. I see people in numbers. And then you listen and they're chanting, all lives matter. Now, I think that was just a snafu on the part of, I, we always say Liberia people they like to be in the fries. <laughs> and I think that was a perfect example. They just wanted to be in the fries and be a part of something and didn't really research. Yeah. So I'm gonna let y'all slide on that, okay? But let's talk about the, the Black Lives Matter versus now this, you know, anti-protest, all lives matter. Um, <laughs> that, I think, one is, that, that one just hits home in so many different ways. Cause you know, when somebody, my sister actually just said this, she was like, you know, when you, you're fighting for breast cancer and you're like, oh, you want to help with breast cancer, and you're wearing your breast cancer shirt, somebody's not going to come up to you and be like, well, what about lung cancer and all the other things? <laughs> right. It's like, well, what we're saying right now is that black lives specifically in America are being targeted mm -hmm. and are being used inappropriately, right? Like, if you, if you want to just narrow it on that, that's what we're trying to say. Black lives, like black people in America, mm -hmm are, you know, they need to be able to live equal lives as well. So it's not about, it's not to say that all lives don't matter. If all lives didn't matter, then you could easily roll off your tongue black lives matter mm -hmm. without a problem. Right, right. So like, the, what's the problem? What's, you can't say it? Well, you can see where they're coming from now. Uh, besides a lack of research, mm -hmm. it's like you, you live in a society where you're, you're born black. Most of the people in power, they're black, mm -hmm. except economically. <laughs> so, another conversation for another time. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I mean, you see, you already know that Black Lives Matter, and then so a lot of them because I've seen several young people de strongly defend this All Lives Matter statement on their Facebook pages, mm -hmm. um, and they they just feel like it's it's racist to say Black Lives Matter. It's even. It's, it almost sounds like things that we hear some of the whites in America say, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it's very strange to me, especially given that it's coming from a country where, you know, only blacks can be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you're saying we can't blame the young people in Liberia. We don't educate them well enough. Right. But you're not talking about Americans. No, no, okay, no, okay. no, no, no. I was like, Jackson, no, no, no. I, me, and, me and Marcel were like, wait a minute. Is this taking a, a left turn here? No, but I agree. Like mm -hmm. they're not, we're not, we don't know. We don't know. They don't have the experience mm -hmm. that you know, say people who have been to America. And I mean, I'm, I'm very light skinned so I have different experiences than somebody who is more dark skinned But there's those experiences are so prevalent, and that's what's so important. Like people don't know they're in Liberia because they have plenty of other struggles. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Plenty. And I mean, I understand. I think 
kind of going on what you're saying from a, a humanistic perspective, right? I think we need to first recognize that this is a human rights issue, right? right. That there actually is only one race. Right, the human. There is only a human race, you know, but we've been separating each other by color, by culture, by tribe, by all of these things. Anywhere in the world, humans find a way to say, oh, we're different from each other. Divisions, yeah. That division, you know, and so someone may be coming from a perspective of, well, from a human rights perspective, all lives, all lives matter, right. you know. But I would flip it and say, well, you're right. You know, from a human perspective, regardless of what race you are, you should be able to feel that this is wrong. Right. That, you know, someone being killed by a knee on their neck is, is a human being. You know, just like you are, if you're Asian, right. if you're Hispanic, if you're white, you know, like, you are a human being, so you should recognize that this is problematic, regardless if it's your community that's being targeted. And something that I really think has been refreshing is when you're looking at a lot of the protests and the marches, you're seeing such a diversity yeah. Yeah, of people. Yeah. Like, you know, it's just like a, a rainbow yeah. assortment of human beings. And I think that in itself says that all lives matter. Yeah, and you know I, what, I, what I think is happening now is this, the generation that's out protesting, yeah. the generations, is it Generation X, Z? I don't know. I don't well, know. millennials. Then. We're millennials, <laughs> technically. Okay, let's see. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I'm, I'm, on, I'm on the tail of the older millennials. Yeah. Older, my older millennials. But I think what we've seen too is like I've seen a few videos of these white teenagers like mm -hmm. confronting their grandparents and yeah. their parents, yeah. and I think that's amazing. I think it it's is. and and they're so they're necessary. So necessary. I saw a video of a girl cussing, oh, well, actually playing the voicemail. Her grandfather left her. And she put a music track on it and was like literally laughing. And I'm like, it couldn't be me. <laughs> I would be scared of that. But it's, I think their generation and the generation to come after them, the babies that are now in the streets protesting with their parents, yeah. growing up with that, like, oh, I remember going to that protest in 2020 with mom and dad for Black Lives Matter. They're growing up in a different era, a different type of situation than their parents or their grandparents had before. Yeah, yeah. For sure, because but they're still. The bottom line is, is there's still in America's system of racism. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. So even as we are scratching the surface, like to me, the Black Lives Matter is just scratching the surface on something that's so much deeper and buried within the system mm -hmm. that, you know, that's why most of us are back here. What yeah. does um, colorism mean in Pan-Africanism? Mm -hmm. So you yeah, touched like on your skin. Yeah. And, yeah. So mm -hmm. who, wants, who wants to kick that one off? Um, I, I, I think it's important for us to give it context. Like right. colorism is discrimination based on your skin tone is usually within the same race. So you have racism when it's going across races, but colorism is you know within let's say the African race of people globally. Um, in somewhere like Brazil, it's really severe mm -hmm. where you know if you go and sit in the sun for too long and you let your hair curl up, you know that may deny you opportunities that you would have gotten if you had been out of the sun to straighten your hair, you yeah. know, like, um, so, I mean, how it affects Pan-Africanism, I think it definitely is something that has been ingrained in African people globally through slavery right. and everything that came after slavery um, to um, aim for being closer to white, right? Like, if you're closer to white, you get a few more passes, you get inclusion in Liberia if you want to bring it home right you know we literally had um, have had have a history of the brown paper bag test you know in many parts of uh, Liberia in order to join certain organizations or to even get housing opportunities you had to be lighter than a brown paper bag um, and so this is really deep <laughs> my husband and I have this debate all the time because you know I always am on like no I wouldn't have gotten no I wouldn't have made it you know what I mean like I'm right on the bag I'm right on the bag I've been on shoot in the dry season I'm, I'm not even on the bag anymore you know you gotta catch me in the winter or rainy season for me to even pass and so the fact that we even have a history so close to home in the first pan African state like that means we were in our own spaces holding each other to mm -hmm. those kind of standards. Yeah. And you know, and it is, it's everywhere in the world. Afro, um, like I said, you know, in Brazil, Afro-Caribbean, um, Afro yeah. Afro-Asian. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's no, I don't know any African group that doesn't have some yeah. um, major issue with colorism. And I think it's serving its purpose to like divide us. Yeah. You know, that if we were not so distracted by something so, you know, superficial, how much further would we be globally, you know, as, as a people? Yeah. yeah. What does that mean in the context of the Black Lives Matter movement, though? 
Mm, that's a great question. Um, I think it definitely is something because even if we look at the people that are being killed, I haven't seen a lot of fair-skinned people in that group, y'all. No, I gotta be honest. I mean, I could, I'm, I'm open to being wrong. I'm sure that our light-skinned brothers and sisters go through their, you know, of course, uh, discrimination as well. But generally, you see more darker-skinned people being targeted more. You know, I have family members that are dark-skinned in the States that I pray for every day. Mm -hmm. And I am not as concerned for them as I am for my family that's in the Fran in France that's like mixed race and, you know, able to blend in a bit more, if you will. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that's what it does. I bet, okay, to, to your point, I, I believe that you're right. Mm. Uh, let's say me and Marcel got pulled over. They may be want to treat us as a darker skinned black person, but when they put in your information, they have to put mm -hmm. black female. Yeah. And I mix with Lebanese. They're not gonna say, oh, she's 25% Lebanese. <laughs> Let me put yeah. that in there. It's a black woman. Even Marcel, she would yeah. still be considered a black person. So I think colorism is definitely a thing, but I think it's more prevalent in these other areas where there's a majority of black people. Mm -hmm. Because I always say this, especially when Africans are like, oh, it's not my problem. No matter what, when you get to that U.S. border, they're going to say, that's a black person, yeah. you's a nigga, mm -hmm. that's, that's the end of it, you know? Yeah. So, to, well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> let's keep it real, let's keep it real, the end of you know, flowing yeah, around, I think yeah, right. yeah, what you're saying is, how does, what does that, how does that affect the Black Lives Matter movement? I still think it boils down to what the basis of it is, it's humanity, mm -hmm. right? What we're trying to say is, it shouldn't matter if you're light skin or if you're dark skin yeah. or if you're pale skin or if you're yellow skin or Asian skin. Mm -hmm. It's so worth that to me we still need to treat people equally. Um, and that's not what's being done in America specifically, right? And that's not what's being done around the world indirectly. Um, and directly if you want to argue that point as well. So I do think it has a significant effect on it. I mean, I get called, listen, listen, I, you can cut this out of the video if you want, but <laughs> it, to my core, boils every single blood in my veins when people call me white woman. Mm. And it is because <laughs> <laughs> No, no problem. This is a real thing. No, it's real. It's, it's real. real. It's a real thing. Real thing. Yeah. Now I'm a quarter, right? My grandfather was Belgian French and he married my grandmother. But so yeah, I'm a quarter Belgian, right? A quarter white if you want to say that. No problem, but for me, living in racist Huntington Beach, California, where white people were very mean, mm. words, actions, and not even just Huntington Beach, San Diego, California, America, the whole place, yeah. it, it didn't feel good to then now be associated with this, this other human being, because it's like, yo, I was actually fighting to be uh, something else, and now I come here, and now I'm a white woman, like, you're deeming me as this, like, cruel person who is higher than you and better than you just because of the color of my skin. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that. I've been preaching against that my whole life, so I come here, and now I have to be that. Um, now, you bring up a good point. I want you guys to listen, because you be in all my comments with this, and they think it's just my perspective. I actually got, have gotten grilled for this. Mm -hmm. Coming to Liberia, I did an episode with my good friend Phil at the African Diaspora Network. And my first interview, I explained this concept that in Liberia, mm -hmm. you are, I was referred to as a white woman. Well, it turned into this whole debacle where all the very pro-black people were like, oh sister, you seem like you confused, you black. I'm like, yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> I'm trying to tell you that too, I'm trying to fight for this too. Um, but also, I let's keep it in Liberia. So we, we said we were gonna get into it, or we're gonna touch on it. As uh, this group of uh, people, you could be considered a white man. You could be considered a white woman, mm -hmm. depending on who's saying it, yes, right? I mentioned something. And then we're, we're not going to get deep into this. This is another conversation. <laughs> but there is, as you all also remind me, that we are from Liberia and we are founded by the free slaves. And there's this divide between the Conga and country, Conga and native um, divide. That's one of the divides that we have here. Mm -hmm. But one of my. Um, Arguments and you guys can chime in on this. Mm -hmm. I think that it's 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 switched or it's switching from Not necessarily where your tribe is or where your your ancestors are from but it's kind of becoming a class thing Yeah, and like yeah. young people, sure. right? Yes, yeah. definitely. I think for me call out in itself I mean, and I don't think we can even have this conversation if we do not address the Konga indigenous divide in Liberia mm -hmm. because it is so deeply entrenched in everything in our country, it's, it's okay. the basis of education, education yeah. and entertainment, and everything. 
Um, and Kongwa was never an, an ethnic group because Kongwa is actually a combination of people. So at a certain point in the slave trade, they just started sending, when it was illegal, right, they started sending boats back to Africa. And so some of those boats that came back came from the Caribbean. Some of the boats came from the South, Southern um, North America, um, or Southern states. And, you know, it, to me, it really has always been about class. You know, and this is actually right in line with the colorism. Because at first, in Liberia, it was really difficult to necessarily um, decipher that class structure, right? You had to, maybe if you were doing a trade or something like that, they would say, okay, you were an educated person or a skilled person, so that would kind of put you in the Congo category. Or if you were very fair-skinned, right? They would actually all automatically assume that you were Congo. But as Liberia has evolved, as we made it through this conflict, that kind of broke that ceiling. You know, that's really what the conflict did. It shattered yeah. that idea because everybody in Liberia was affected by that conflict. Mm -hmm. There's not a single Liberian in the right. world who hasn't been touched by it. It kind of like started to equalize things for us to really recognize like we are not <laughs> that different. Mm -hmm. And if we cannot make opportunities available to everyone, no one's gonna really enjoy this beautiful, mm -hmm. this beautiful place, you know? So I think it definitely is something that um, touches on this idea of stop seeing ourselves, African people globally, like we have to stop seeing ourselves as different, recognize what our history has been, address it. I think people are so afraid to even talk about it. Like if you sit at certain tables, People start getting more nervous, <laughs> you know, you bring that thing up, and it's like, y'all, this is, it's really pronounced yeah. in the way that we treat each other, so why are we acting like we can't sit here and discuss well, that? Because people that don't know how to, like, just, if you disagree or if you have, like, a difference of opinion, like, yeah. you still don't know how to, like, just live with each other and move with each other and mm -hmm. still kind of just get, you know, some cliche, just get along, but it's like, you have to have these honest and open conversations, yeah. even if you don't agree. I think one of the uh, meaningful outcomes of having these conversations and talking about Black Lives Matter is uh, the need um, that it has against it and all of us to look at our biases towards the other, mm -hmm. um, how we see other people of lighter, lighter, uh, lighter darker skin, uh, people of different class. Mm -hmm. We have a very stratified society. Um, in Liberia, we, we, we have a class system. Um, and certain people based on family history of, of different things have had um, access to more mm -hmm. and that has given them some level of uh, a head start. Yeah. Um, and having these set of conversations and looking around and, and looking and seeing what's happening uh, and how it's hurting other people so far away from us, um, but still really connected to us, how can we start meaningful conversations around some of the things you were speaking about, Nikita? Yeah. Uh, how do we ensure that we are being as fair to people around us? We, we are having uh, the right and meaningful conversations around how uh, people have had, uh, historically, uh, they have had a head start. Mm -hmm. um, how do we ensure that you know we're being, uh, things are being equitable, uh, we, people have access to opportunities, not just based on uh, their family background or who they are, who they, are, who they knew before, uh, but on the basis of marriage, all the things we talk about. Exactly um, how it parallels. That, you know, mm -hmm. all the things we talk about that is happening because black people have historically been marginalized yeah. for 450 years in America. Yeah. What can we do within our own societies to ensure that we're not mirroring that, we're not a reflection of that same fear of the other and suppress the other kind of thing? I think definitely like Kongo as a class, because that's what it, honestly from the beginning, I feel like it was. It was a much more exclusive class in the very beginning, but especially post-conflict, now that so many people from all backgrounds have been able to go out of Liberia, and not just necessarily to the States, but any other part of Africa, and get education and things like that, right? It's now a, it's a wider class, you know, and we have to decide you know, how do we open up that access and share the privilege, you know? Right. The first thing is having a conversation and allowing people to be upset. You know, I think with all of this is happening, they're like, why are they looting and breaking down places? Yeah. And you know, this is anger, this is yeah. resentment, rage. you know, it rage. rage. If you've been held down and oppressed, 
for hundreds of years. You're going to feel away. Mm -hmm. And you can't tell someone, oh, you can't be mad, or why y'all vexed, or that was before. It was like, no, it's not before. You know, it's still happening now. And exactly, we had to acknowledge karma privilege. You know, like, this is something I say this all the time. I had um, a friend of mine that would really bring it up all the time in, like, a few years ago, you know, mm-hmm. and it's something because I, yes, I come from a lineage of Congo people, but I still have a mixture of Vai, Gola, Pele blood because very few people in Liberia are just a hundred percent. Yeah, right, right. Anything, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but I didn't really recognize like how that positioned me. I moved to Liberia eight years ago, and for many of my friends and family that would be maybe even be interested in moving to Liberia, they couldn't move the way I did. I came to a family that already mm-hmm. had a business that already was established in a certain way that would be able to like help me right. integrate into society in a way that if you're coming back and your people have never really had, you have to really struggle, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. And we need to be honest about that and talk about how, what, you know, tangible things can we do to like share some of that privilege so mm-hmm. that all of us, we can really create a middle class in Liberia. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is the same sharing of privilege that white people have to do and some people don't want to come off of it. But no. you're going to have to come up with it. You know, like for any of us to really enjoy the world and to say that we are all human beings and we're moving from a place of positivity or as from a humanistic lens is like recognizing, okay, something's went awry. How do we fix it? And going all the way even back to people that, you know, a lot of people would say, a lot of people would say, oh, well, they sold us. You know, like, how far are we going to take it back? Because mm-hmm. how did we end up in North America, right? Exactly. Like, we ended up there because some of our family members sold us into slavery. So I think we just need to tell, everybody needs to tell each other, Nama. Nama. That is sorry. And it's not a And it's not everybody, Nama. And now this is where we find ourselves today. You know, it's the same thing that I've seen a lot of white people. I don't know if y'all saw these people that were washing feet at a protest. Yeah. I saw that, that was a little bit. I, I, saw that. That. I was like, I saw that. Give us reparations. Yeah, I was like, yeah. 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 I'm on my 40s. Where my jacket? Yeah. 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 And, and, and to piggyback off of you, which a lot of my um, yeah. subscribers always ask, this is a great point she makes because you all are always asking me mm. or being angry. The conversation that I had with Rio, which was a great conversation. But a lot of people were like, you guys are saying that because you have right. something to go back to. Yeah. Um, and we fully agree with that. But we, as you can see, we have to clean house first yeah. before we can first even thing. reach out to the African-American um, population and mm-hmm. say, and I'm always not biased. I say, listen, I want you guys to come visit the continent, come visit Liberia, yeah. but don't jump up and move. It's not easy. Even for yeah. us who yeah. had mm-hmm. a base here, you know, it was, I'm still, Four years later, I'm still transitioning. Right. Yeah. Me too. Four, five years later, I'm yeah. still yeah. We're still, we're, it, it, but you have to have that spirit in you. You, uh, you have to be able to let go of those conveniences mm-hmm. in America. And that's yeah. a huge thing that a lot of people are the thing, though. For me, it's like, okay, I gave up, I, I'm telling my friend this the other I gave up escalators for freedom. Darn. You know, and I feel a lot more free here. I feel a lot more, mm. even though I get called by a woman and there's colorism, I do feel like, uh, <laughs> you're allowed to laugh, Jeff. I do feel a lot, my hands can touch more here in the sense of like, yeah. I can have property here. It's actually, in my mind, it's feasible, whereas in the U.S. I feel like, yo, oh, there's so much red taking, there's so much against mm-hmm. You know, my people, or just people in general. There's, mm-hmm. there's definitely people putting each other down. It's, it's just. And the conversation that's being had a lot all, all right. over the world is about building generational wealth. Yeah. Um, and although you might be giving up those conveniences in the U.S., if you come here, there's more of an opportunity in not only Liberia, anywhere on the continent, that yes. you can actually solidify that generational wealth. You can own something. You know, so many things. So many, so many things you can do. Um, you know, and people in America, this is for all races. I mean, you, if you look at the system, it's actually wild. And when I moved here, maybe you guys will feel the same. In America, the whole credit system, you know, you have to fight hard to maintain credit, to Mm -hmm. lease, to mortgage. Mm -hmm. It's a never-ending cycle of those who are in power and those who are in power are not us. Not brown folks, not black folks, not nothing. But here you come, you make that sacrifice. It's going to be hard. It's going to be hard. (laughs) But you have to be able to make that decision. Uh, it's a big jump. I think we all probably have our own stories on them. Big leap of faith. Big leap of faith. <laughs> you know, it's a huge one. <laughs> so since we're on the topic of Liberia, uh, let's let's get into this. You know, we've talked about our 
our background of how Liberia was formed. A lot of people have been saying um, in this time where America is just making everybody shame all across the world, um, should Liberians now re-examine our basis of our country, our flag, um, our relationship with the U.S. Exactly. Constitution. I mean, now for those of you who don't know much about Liberia, it was founded by free slaves. If you visit our country today, um, you'll see street signs that are very um, familiar to America. Monrovia was named after Monroe. Mm -hmm. All these, a lot of American influence. And I've seen a lot of uh, questions about that. So how do you guys feel about renaming well, um, I, you know, I think that the conversation has to start with just people needing to be educated on the history. You yeah. know, as human beings, human nature, we, we tend to forget history. Like, that's why the biggest saying, right, history repeats itself. Like, we know that for a fact, but yet we don't study, and I'm a teacher, trust me, we don't study history and we don't examine it to use it to reflect to move forward. So for me, it's, it's more about education and letting people know, like, Listen, I know all you want is your visa to America, but trust me, when you go there, it's not the same thing that you can see. You know, it is tough, it is hard, it, there are a lot of opportunities, but just so you know, here's this, 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 and this as well. Um, I, I mean, I'm, I'm for moving Liberia in a, move, a forward movement that does not have so much attachment to America. Um, this history is told um, by, in a way that's biased against some of the so-called natives. Um, and for me personally, when I look at a Liberian flag, I get very annoyed, I hate seeing it. Uh, it looks too much like the American flag. And I hate that we have a day to celebrate somebody who created something that's so unoriginal. Mm. And our Pledge of Allegiance, oh, yeah. the only reason why it's different from the American Pledge of Allegiance right now is because uh, some Republicans in the US decided to add um, under God to theirs. That's the only reason. So we have the exact Pledge of Allegiance. For me, as a pan-African country, mm -hmm. by the way, Haiti was there before us. <laughs> as a pan-African country, that was a that was, that was a yeah. as a pan-African country, it just it hurts that we're clinging to all these yeah. these images, these yeah. these things that you know they're so American, and we need. We need to find a way to come up with something new. And I, I know uh, the former president, Ellen Jones, believes she started a project on this and uh, uh, Professor Elwood Dunn, hmm. he was leading this. I don't know where this has gone so far, but I think this is something that in order for us to, uh, I know Nikita talked about the need to start, you know, sharing some of the privileges and trying to make amends for some of the uh, Liberia's original sin, I guess, mm -hmm. um, yeah. since America had their own too. Mm -hmm. um, we we need to first look at our symbols. What, what does it say about us? Yeah. We need to at least start changing that first. Then we can at least, if we can change the symbolic things, can we start touching anything that's tangible? Ooh, that's oh, that's, but then another argument on that could be is, um, like you said, cleaning of house. So you see what, what's happening now in America. They're taking down these statues that symbolize the Confederate flag. NASCAR just took that out. Yeah. Um, but NASCAR. Uh -huh. NASCAR, yes. Wow. NASCAR okay. has NASCAR banned NASCAR. the Confederate flag. Yeah. That they're out. NASCAR. Yeah, NASCAR, yeah. which I never expected. I was actually shocked. I was shocked when I saw that. I was yeah. shocked by that. Um, but it, to me, it's like they have, Americans have, or America has that structure, right? Where they, they can do that. We have a lot of other things that we need to fix mm -hmm. before we start talking about symbolism. But I think that you just made a really good point. If we can't address those things, can we yeah. truly move on as a country? Well, I think it's yeah. a really big thing that you have to address, the symbolism, because that's really what innately grows you from your core as to what Liberia is, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, when you have other things like the cola nut, I didn't even know how significant that was. I just knew that my mom would leave it around the house all the time, mm -hmm. and it was bitter. You know, but when you come back here, yeah. when you come back, you really, or you know, you learn about it, right? Because we're all displaced. We all lost some type of uh, connection. When you come back and you see the significance of it, it's like, wait, why isn't that on the seal? Or mm -hmm. why isn't that on the why? Well, my, but, but my question is, or what I'm trying to argue is, as a Liberian, um, or an average Liberian could care less about the flag and the symbol because they need to have 
water. They need mm. to have food. That's you know, right. our infrastructure is. We have a long way to go for that before we even start talking about symbolism, right? I mean, I think it's something that's going to have to happen parallel, yeah. right? Like, I don't think we really have the convenience to do one and then the other. Right. Right? Like, we have to really start addressing it all. Um, and the time is I'll now. Have a book out for me. <laughs> I have a very controversial view. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. But I really feel like, um, as a Pan African state, it's an embarrassment. Mm. I, I literally don't even hang the flag. I don't. Like I don't hang it. I hang the county flags mm -hmm. yeah. before I ever would hang the national flag. The seal also omits majority of the yeah. population. Yep. You know, the love of liberty brought us here. But what about the people yeah, that are already here? here. Yeah, you know, so I think. Yeah, yeah. You know. <laughs> absolutely necessary and um, I'm very interested to hear that there already has been some you know work in the public sector towards this I would be interested to learn more um, because I hope that you know God grants me 50 60 more years that in my lifetime as a people that we will change it I think we will not really be able to heal I don't think we'll be You know, um, I'm really hoping that we will change it because I don't see how we're really going to heal yeah. until we do it, you know, and um, we got to get from under the watchful eye of our professor, mm -hmm. basically. You know, this idea when I was younger, I was so proud of this concept, I used to do pageants. And, you know, when it would come to Liberia, my big fact was we were the only country on the continent, or just us in Ethiopia, it's two of us, on the continent of Africa that never, you know, was colonized. But as I've grown and as I live here now, it is a lie. We are still colonized, you know, and the fact that we don't understand who our colonizer is, I think, puts us in a lot of trouble. As opposed to other countries who knew who their colonizer was and actually got independence from that colonizer, we don't even recognize um, that, you know, I mean, I'm gonna have to keep it real. Like just today, we talk about the USD shortage in Liberia. You go to the ATM, there's no USD, you know. Is so like entrenched into our society, and we are supporting that country in so many ways. We've been integral to like many of the like World War II. We were a base that was used. Um, our resources. Let's talk about Firestone and the Hundred Year Contract and all the other things and all the things that are pulled out of Liberia to support this country that doesn't respect us. Right. You know, there was a whole documentary that we are the stepchild of America. America's stepchild. The redhead stepchild. Yeah, I'm really not one Like. We need to get from under the thumb. And you know, if if we cannot get full exit of them, if they're so entrenched into what we're doing, then we definitely need to change the conversation. Okay. Um sorry. <laughs> I just okay. I know it's like we're like gosh. <laughs> like, it's a hot topic. Yeah, hot this topic. is there's so much it's there's so much to unpack yeah, there. Yeah. And it's like maybe the way the reason why is like this like we don't we welcome America when 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 Liberia was when Liberia was like in the early stages American ships used to come to prevent you know the British and the uh, French from encroaching upon the territory mm -hmm. they used the Liberian government used to ask Amer America for help to you know conquer more territories mm -hmm. so I mean I, and even when we have war, we call on America to come and, and mm -hmm. come in. Why? I, I don't. Don't get me wrong. I don't. I don't. I don't want our symbols to be America's symbol. Mm -hmm. But let's all recognize that we've had a privileged relationship with America, and yeah. so on. No, we have. Unlike and unlike other African countries, we're the stepchild. I mean, it's, it's a not a privilege, privilege, right? It's, it's not a privilege. Let me play. It's a, not a privilege. There's a reason why we're getting a lot more money per capita than. Other African countries, but then look at our state of being. All the that money, one, that that's not that's 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 this is us, we let them. Yeah. yeah. What do you say? It's our own people. Yeah. Yeah. But that's not to be boiled down to the, the basis of what we're saying is that either we need to we need to revamp how we're using our ties. And yeah. that's something we that we need to change the conversation. And you have to have that open, honest, 
very real conversation with our relationship. With yeah, that. agreed. Well, we can't always look at America as a bad guy. Mm. I like to say they do mostly like, the bad guy. Um, <laughs> so we we have attempted at a small Liberia to teach this class called Understanding Liberia. It's mm. one of the hardest things I've ever attempted to do. Mm. Um, Me too. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> figuring out what the Liberian identity is, we talked mm. through and spoke to Dr. Dunn, um, a lot of different Liberian historians, and it's a struggle for all of us involved to figure out um, what what it is to be a Liberian or you know what identifies us as Liberians, right? Um, and our symbolism, our flags, our seal, and all of those things uh, would be a reflection or should be a reflection of how we see ourselves and uh, how we identify. Um, but like what happened with the NASCAR and the Confederate flag, their, their justification is we want this place to be welcoming for everyone and these things are not a symbol that welcomes everyone. So uh, is, is that the same thing for our flag and our, our, our seal and, and those set of things? Are they representative of who we are as a people? Mm -hmm. uh, is, 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 is the history that is told that represented through these uh, symbols just the history of the, uh, the elite class, the political class, um, or is it the history of everyone who fought struggle to make Liberia what it is, or, or is a representation of what Liberia is? Uh, not just the, uh, the, the political class that made the decision mm -hmm. at the time. So it is a, it's definitely a conversation that should be had. Uh, not just because we, we necessarily want to separate ourselves from, from America and, and what we think they represent, but we want, to, uh, we want to ensure that our representation, the things that we put out there and say this is who we are, is more of a reflection of us right. than uh, than uh, mostly a reflection of uh, a segment of the society. Right. Mm -hmm. And like you said, how do you how do you encapsulate the us as Liberian? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because again, for being called white woman, like I don't I don't always get classified as a Liberian person, right? But to me, it's, I was raised Liberian in my mm -hmm. mind. But when I come back to Liberia here, there's also like, oh, but you don't know how to eat. Swallow GB or whatever, you know, whatever. You I do. <laughs> I was like, girl, we need to go class tomorrow. Um, but I think you make a very good point, you know, that Liberia's identity is diverse, it is complicated, it's deep. You know, um, from the very beginning, we know that not only indigenous Liberians, of course, were here, but there are Caribbean Liberians, if you would call it like that, people that have Caribbean background. Um, people that have Indian and Lebanese people that have been here for several generations, it's very difficult to try to separate them also from the Liberian identity. You know, so we need symbols that are representative of who we really are as a people. I think it would be a really fresh, clean start, you know, that if we all sat at a table and really decided, okay, this is who we choose to be. And um, it's not to identify America as the bad guy. But to recognize that, you know, in my opinion, I think that the, our relationship has been more beneficial to them than it has to Liberians, and that's something that really needs to change. Yeah. yeah. So this has been great. We're not over yet, but I, I think a lot of people, especially the viewers, want to hear more and more perspectives about Liberia and how we move forward. So there will be more on that. But to bring the conversation to a close, how do we, um, what is a tangible solution? to stop the attack against melanated people worldwide, in your, in your opinion? Is there something that could stand out, one thing that they, could be changed or implemented to uh, to bring the progress of that? Buy black. Okay. I think to me that's the number one thing. That's a good you know, African people, first of all, I really hate this concept of people calling themselves black. I really don't know where, like, where it started. I mean, you it started know, America, right? yeah. it is starting in America. Yeah. I mean, I guess people, white people are called white, well, technically, are they Caucasian? What, what, I don't know what the actual term title yeah. is. But well, I, feel I, like, know that, I feel like in Latin America, they always have the standardized test where you can just categorize yeah, 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 it. Yeah, that's, that's where it came from. Check the box. Check the box. I don't recall doing that in England. But I feel like it separates uh, African people from their home. You know, like, we're already pulled from our continent and scattered all over the place. I think for me, it's such an injustice as a you know as an African person that it's difficult for most of us to go back past five or six generations. We literally cannot because we've been scattered so much that we don't even know like our history. There are people that know 20 generations back because they were never displaced, they were never removed from you know from their lineage. 
Um, but I think if African people globally decided that 60, 70, 80 percent of my buying power, I'm going to exclusively look for. I'm going to take the time and find uh, someone that is in my community that makes that product, that does that service, and I'm going to endorse them. I'm going to choose to spend my money within my community. I think that would uplift us immensely. I agree that um, part of the solution is economics, because economics is politics. So um, right now, it, we're separated based on color. Um, that is the segregation. But also that line is separated based on who has most of the wealth versus who doesn't. Uh, so in order to close that gap, we have to ensure that uh, investment, real investment is happening in the, in the black community. Uh, one, and then two, politics. You have to be in a room where decisions are being made. Yeah. If the outcomes of policy are, uh, is going to affect black people, yeah. there has to be a black voice in that room. Mm -hmm. There has to be a black person who can tell you the real black experience. Um, or at least, uh, so usually you have five, six people, and then there's one black person who's mm -hmm. supposed to tell you the black experience, but the black experience is not one experience, right? Yeah. I have a completely different experience from what myself has. So in showing that we, there are a lot of us in that room so that we're able to say, hey, this doesn't make sense, uh, which usually doesn't, um, and this is what we serve <laughs> our community better. Um, so economics, politics, get in, uh, ensure that we're, we're making the right investment in the black community and we're getting involved uh, at the political level to ensure that we're part of the policy decisions. Definitely need to see the table. I really love that. I mean, I'm always, I'm an educator for the future. I'm always going to say education. You can't, you can't make good decisions mm -hmm. with that education. Mm -hmm. um, and that to me, for me, means breaking it at the very step of where it starts. You know, you have to teach what's real history and not just what is prescribed history by the person who is in uh, you know, charge, which is again why we need to see this table. And the only way we get to see that table is if we use our buying power to do so. I, I, I was reading, um, I forget the title or the name of the author, but I read a, an opinion piece by a Nigerian um, author, I think it was in Foreign Policy, and basically his uh, thesis was that in order for um, black people and Africans worldwide to be respected globally, we need to have an African superpower that is uh, at a first first world level, whatever that is, a, a developed African superpower. Mm -hmm. And he explained how when, as the African countries started to gain independence and they, they started to go to the US and visit uh, dignitaries, how they had to be treated properly. You know, you, you have to give them place in the diplomatic area, whatever it is, whatever uh, courtesies that you have to uh, provide. So it, it starts to shift the mindset because People, right now, people can look at China and say, wow, look how great China is. Like, nobody's going to doubt that to, to make a blanket statement to say, you know, Chinese people are, are dumb, whatever. We've seen what China can accomplish. Mm -hmm. Imagine if we had a Nigeria or if Liberia was able to get there. Yeah. To, <laughs> to be like this powerful country where, you know, innovation is coming from there. It, the economy is amazing. How difficult would it be for people to just so easily dismiss an entire race mm, when you right. can point to something not that we, we all know this because uh, a lot of us if you, if we were we were raised in Liberia or we educate self-educated ourselves on our own uh, accomplishments of our people we know this but they don't so it's it's much easier when when that presence is always there uh, and I think that's that's on us, you know. Maybe we have to put our hands together in making Liberia great. Yeah. You know. Making Liberia great. Oh, that's my dad. It was. Not again. 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 But I think you guys make all all make great points. Uh, I want to thank you all again. This is like the best first round table. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I, I already knew it was going to be good, but this is great. Um, but I want to thank you all for being a part of this. And I want to encourage you all to pay attention to the video once it's up on YouTube because it's about engagement. And I know a lot of, uh, of my followers want to engage in conversation. So I encourage you to do that. <laughs> get ready. You might not get all the comments. Yeah. Yeah. I hope I didn't talk too much for the person that said that. I hope got your other opinions in, but I also want you guys to stay tuned. 
we are um, trying to do some things here to connect with our African American brothers and sisters in America, all around the globe. So in the next week, we'll be doing some events. Um, Juneteenth is a very important uh, date in black history, and we are going to commemorate that with something here in Liberia. Uh, check the hashtag on social media, Liberians for BLM, and stay tuned. Yeah. You'll see all these beautiful people there, hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. You guys take care. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Thank you for doing this. Yeah. Right. Thanks for watching another episode of Philomena.com. If you like this episode, make sure you click like and subscribe. See you next time.